I'm packaging all my experiences as a renter over the past few years, having had the opportunity to rent multiple spaces, and I'm putting it together so that you can take my experiences and hopefully use it to your advantage. The first step is it's important to put yourself in the property owner's shoes. Understand that it is a business, and at the end of the day, if you owned that property, you would want to be able to put somebody in that space who's going to take care of it and pay their bills so that you can go ahead and then pay your mortgage. It's important to then take an inventory of your current situation. And I usually separate those into two different categories, needs versus wants. And needs are things that you cannot compromise and you absolutely need them. So that could be things like a certain amount of bedrooms, a certain amount of bathrooms, a certain distance from your work, a specific school district that you need to be in, proximity to family, whatever that is, you make a needs list. And then there's wants, and the wants are things that would be nice to have, all things considered, but you don't really need them. And you can compromise and forego those at the end of the day. And those could be things like maybe a garage, maybe a pool, a gym on site, or proximity to re specific restaurants that you like. Whatever that is, those are things that can be compromised. So then that leads us to monthly payment versus monthly income. And the tenant must be able to make three times the rent payment. That's not a rule, but that's typical for what, it, what most people will see. Some markets may be a little less, some may be a little more. But let's take example, landlord Steve rents to Billy. If the rent costs $1,500, then Billy must make $4,500 a month minimally after all his debts are paid. So if Billy's monthly income is $5,000 and he has a car payment of $500, 5,000 minus 500 is 4,500. He will meet the requirements for renting that apartment. Now in the case of roommates, my recommendation is that you shouldn't get into a situation where you wouldn't be able to carry the monthly payments on your own if all your roommates were to be out of the picture at some point. And a lot of times landlords will take that into consideration and they will want all of the tenants, even if there's three of them, to have three times the monthly rent in order to make sure that they're gonna get their payments on time. Another factor is credit score and background checks. And typically landlords and property owners will be looking at this because they're, the thought behind it is that if you have paid your bills on time and you have a higher credit score, you are less likely to default on payments to them. And the typical credit score that they're looking for is about 650, but depending on the area and the competitiveness of the area, and the type of building that you're applying to. If it's a luxury building, the credit score requirements could be higher. If it's not as nice of a building, the credit requirements could be lower. And in addition to that, the background checks are just to make sure that there's no criminal history, or if there is, that they know who they're renting to so that they are aware of it prior to the individual coming into their property. And for anybody who may not have the highest credit score, towards the end of the video, I'll include a few tips and tricks that you can use to position yourself a little better and make yourself a little more competitive when it comes to applying for these apartments. Next topic is security deposits. Any rental will typically have a deposit that they require in the event that when you move out, if there's any damages, they just take money from that security deposit and apply it to the damages that you caused. Um, so let's say, for example, in any situation, you're going to have a probably a one month to a three month security deposit. But I'd say you, it's probably safe to budget between one to one and a half months or so. And then that deposit will be kept separately from your from your rent. So if you decide to move out, you can't just get that back right away until they have come evaluated the space and made sure that there are no damages that weren't there before. So. One of the things that you should do is always take pictures of the entire property and any defects that you see prior to you moving it, because then that will allow you to be able to be ahead of the curve and making sure that they're not charging you for anything that you did not cause. So let's talk about agreement lengths. Uh, so typically I usually have signed a 12 month lease and the 12 month lease allows you to live in a space from the time that the agreement starts till the time that the agreement ends. And after that, you can move on to whatever else you wanna do after the fact, or you can renew it if they allow you to do so. You can also see out their month to month leases, and typically month to month leases 
are no formal agreement in terms of like a time frame and you just pay month to month until one of you decides that you either need the space or they need the space from you or you want to move on to something different. Those are typically a little bit more expensive just because there's no locked in contract and it can be, it can change over time in terms of price. Now you can also see three month leases, six month leases, nine month leases, longer term leases, and it all depends, but typically you'll usually see a 12 month or a month to month lease. It's very common for landlords and property owners to request references from you when you fill out your application. So that could be people from the previous jobs, uh, supervisors or managers from previous jobs, uh, previous landlords and property owners that you rented from. And their goal is just basically to make sure that you are who you say you are and you acted appropriately when you were in those situations. And that's basically the reason they asked for references. In my experiences, most people did not call them. However, I've had several situations where they did as well and they've you know, thoroughly checked all my references. So be nice to everyone because you, know, you may need a good reference from them in the future. Now that we have a good understanding of our current situation and how the landlord property owner perspective works, we can then take a look uh, at different listings and search based on our current situation and the information that we've identified about ourselves. Now, when we're going out there, we're gonna use a few different websites and apps. I suggest mostly doing everything online just because it helps you get more information at your fingertips readily, readily and more easily accessible rather than you driving around from apartment building to apartment building. But um, here's a few websites that I would recommend. I'd start with Zillow Rentals. I have found a couple places on there and that worked great for me. Um, I'd look for Redfin, Trulia, Apartments.com. And then you can also take a look at a few local real estate brokerages, especially if you're in a very highly densely populated area, such as downtown Los Angeles or some of the beach cities. And then one of my favorite places to look now is Craigslist because Craigslist a lot of times has people who are listing their own properties up for sale uh, or up for, up for rent. And it's just easier to work with private owners, in my opinion. And that's just something that I've experienced almost each time. They're a lot easier to work with than some of the corporations. So a lot of times private owners typically just want to have somebody in their space paying the bills and they're not necessarily looking to get the highest rent that they possibly can. Sometimes they are, but in most instances that I've dealt with private owners, they're not looking to be greedy. And a lot of times they are very reasonable, much easier to deal with than corporations because corporations are always looking at the dollar value and you can guarantee that they're going to be asking as much as they possibly can from you. So just something to consider when you're in your search. While using the apps, I think it's very useful for you to use the filter settings because if you can filter it, all your listings based on the specific search criteria that you're looking for or the specific needs you have while including some of the wants, it can give you a very good idea of how much you're going to pay in that area by taking some of the low end prices and some of the high end prices and figuring out where you want to be in all of that. Now that's kind of my recommendation and I use all of those and set up reminder emails to be able to, const to constantly bombard you with all the information that you can because the more information you have and the more listings you're seeing, you will have a better, a better chance of getting one of them. And you have to act quickly, especially if you're in a competitive market because usually it's the early bird gets the worm in this situation. I was usually one of the first one or two people to go out to try to get this, to get the listings and I was able to get them in multiple cases. Sooner or later, you will start getting responses on all the information that you start inquiring on. So when you're out there looking, you're going to get callbacks. It is very difficult to keep track of everything if you don't have it written down somewhere. My recommendation is using a spreadsheet tool. If you use spreadsheets, you can put the name of the place, contact, contacts, addresses, phone numbers, everything that you're possibly going to need. And if you like a specific place more than another, you can put a little check mark next to it saying that that's a high priority place for you. And that's just a lot easier to manage when you are getting bombarded by sometimes dozens, if not maybe a hundred different listings or people who are looking to get in touch with you. A few things that you might find are different separate costs for amenities, uh, furniture, sometimes they will charge you if you need to use their furniture. Utilities is typically another additional cost. 
if you're living if you're single and you're living in something like a studio or one bedroom it's also possible that they can even include the utilities in there which i would negotiate for if you are in that situation and then uh, pets as well too if you have pets it's also possible that they will say no pets whatsoever or they will ask you for a deposit or a certain monthly fee to keep a pet in the house now let's go and talk about a few buyer beware things that you need to know before you get into any kind of contract i would say you need to see any property that you're actually seriously considering for a few different reasons one you want to know who you're dealing with and then two, you wanna make sure that the building looks to be in the condition that's acceptable. It doesn't need to be very high luxury or anything like that, but if there's shingles falling off the roof and paint peeling from the walls, then you should be a little concerned because then when you need help for repairs, the likelihood that you're going to get the help is minimal. Now, in addition to that, you can also look up reviews on property management companies or apartment complexes, and based on those reviews, that can help you determine whether or not that could be or could not be a place that you wanna live. Now, the third thing that I would hope that you consider is, is the scams that are out there. I've actually seen a few scams on some of these various websites, and keep that in mind that they are out there, and there's really nothing that anybody can do to to stop them because once they're posted, it's it's free to the public and there's really no regulation on it until somebody identifies it as a scam and takes it down. But they're usually very outrageous stories of people who are on deployment with lung cancer and that's the reason they can't pick up the phone or why they can't see you in person. They want you to wire them $3,000 or send them $3,000 in cash through the mail. Just please don't fall for these scams. Do not send anybody any money without seeing them, meeting them first, and knowing that what you're getting into is legitimate. And then finally, I would say it's really important to know what you're signing. If you are getting into a lease agreement, please make sure you read all the lines. I know it's a lot, but it's better that you spend the time and take the time to read everything and to understand it rather than to sign something and then fall into something that you weren't really expecting later on. So those are a few tips that I would consider every single time to make sure that you're not getting into a situation that you shouldn't be in. So the next part of our process is negotiating. And I know this could probably be the least fun for some people, but if you are, if you have taken the time to look through your application and to know that you've put together a st strong application with a good story, you understand the area that you're looking in and you know the price ranges, then now's the time for you to be able to negotiate a price that you're comfortable with because you know what you bring to the table. So let's go ahead and start talking about a couple things. Price, you wanna make sure you know what the prices are for that area, what's high, what's low, and where you can potentially get this specific place for. And then if the market is not competitive, you may have more room to negotiate. If the market is competitive, then you may not be able to negotiate as much, but a couple things that you can do to ask for a discount is just saying, hey, you know, look, I pay my rent on time, I have a great application, I know this is kind of what things are renting for in the area, can you give me another $100 off per month? And if they say no, you might wanna position it in a way where you say, hey, well, can you give me one month of free rent? Because essentially what that does is that gives you the month of free rent, they get the price that they still want per month, but you get a little bit of a break. So that's typically one of the things that I've done and it's, it's worked fairly well in the past. There was also an instance in my past rentals where what I did was I put six months down up front and then paid every month until the sixth month was up and that covered me for the entire year, but they got all their money six months before they even before the term even ended. So for them, it was a good deal. And for me, I got a better deal on it. If your credit isn't where you want it to be or you really don't have credit, there are a few things that you can do. And the first is having a co-signer. This is where you go and you have somebody sign to be on the agreement with you. And if they have better credit, then that will bring your chances up by holding them personally responsible for your payments if you default. Now keep that in mind, that is kind of a serious ask of somebody. So your second option would then be to save up a larger down payment or a larger deposit payment and have that available to the property owner in the case that you default on your own. This is probably your better option and something that will give you more grace and more 
possibility of being accepted into the agreement. Additionally, you may be able to show that your work history and income is enough alone to be able to qualify if the credit isn't strong enough, or you can potentially go and pull more records to see if you can present them to the property owner to give you better chances at an agreement. Overall, with all things considered, you have a lot going for you and you can go out and find a place that you want at a reasonable price if you follow these steps. But these are just my experiences, things that I've done to help me out, and every everybody's situation is going to be a little bit different. Now, I will say though, no matter what your situation, there's one thing that you can do to help set your life up and make it a little bit easier for you down the, down the line. And that's just being a good tenant. If something in the house breaks, if a light bulb goes out, if it's minor and you can fix it, then just fix it. I'm not saying that you should go and redo the electrical of the house or redo the plumbing of the house because that's not your responsibility, but for the smaller things, take care of those because the less headache you give the landlord or the property owner, the more they're going to like you. And if you are overall a good person and you treat them with respect, later on down the line when you need to move to something else, they're going to be a great reference for you, or they should hopefully be a great reference for you. But let me know down in the comments what you thought about all this. I hope it was helpful. And thank you again, and hopefully you subscribe and let me know if you have any questions.